And um, hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, although I would have preferred to be um, here yeah, physically. <laughs> uh, so today I'll be talking about um, building models, the way we build uh, open source software. Right. And um, here is a little bit about my background. Um, Steven Kolaoli, I'm an early career researcher at the ML Collective, and I'm based in Nigeria. Um, I also do machine learning engineering and analytics, where we try to um, do opinion mining, real time opinion mining from, uh, from social media platforms uh, for uh, crypto assets. Uh, yeah, so I tend to be a little bit philosophical when especially when I'm frustrated. <laughs> and then, yeah, um, a little bit of a nuisance when it comes to food. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on. So here's a little bit of background about this uh, talk. Um, in uh, late last year in December, Colin Raphael, who is a professor at uh, UNC, uh, uh, well, who came up with this um, very revolutionary idea, you know, um, and is about to, uh, uh, is about a call to build models the same way we build uh, open source software. And uh, in fact, most of this talk and even slides were based on uh, Colin's uh, original talk on this particular topic. Yeah. So basically, what I'll be doing here is more of a, a survey of, uh, of the idea itself, of the ongoing work in that direction, and the questions that are left for us to answer that are currently on our side. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, let's um, walk a little bit to history so we understand where we are coming from and uh, where we are going to. So yeah, this is the first piece and uh, it's uh, it's an antiquated photo of a machine learning engineer fine-tuning uh, an SGBoost model, you know, back then ML algorithms were, you know, powered by steam technology <laughs> okay okay i'm trying to push it to you I, I don't know if uh, any one of you got fooled by that <laughs> okay yeah so to be exact the first uh, deep learning uh model was uh i think 1962 or 1963 by a soviet um mathematician and um, it's it's uh, an inductive it, it's a, it's like an uh mop a multi-layer uh, perception, but without the back propagation. So it makes use of inductive statistic, statistical learning to uh, make predictions. And um, of course, there weren't many headways between 1960 to 1990, but uh, two important factors that I want to point out. One is that um, there was the AI winter in which uh, uh, funding for um, AI projects were stopped. I mean, were sort of cut drastically and there are a lot of factors contributing to this including you know the overhype about ai uh, the economic factors due to the cold war but those are like factors that you know contributed to the winter's period well uh one important factor i want to point out is is the lack of uh, the the unstability of uh, the computational resources that we had as at that time right they weren't uh, powerful enough to uh, uh, to power the kind of projects, the kind of AI experiments that, you know, that are needed to be on. So between 1990 to uh, 2000s, uh, there were like very little innovations, but two of the most notable ones were SVM and LSTM. And then in the 2000s, we, we started experiencing the AI spring, which is still the, uh, still the pace in which we are right now. And, um, well, what was the biggest change um, in the AI string uh, uh, evolution? I would say that <laughs> the biggest change is that we waited to have faster computers. We waited to have uh, faster computational resources to run the kind of projects, uh, uh, the kind of experiments that uh, we need to run uh, here. Okay, so um, now in the modern era, uh, there are a lot of um, stuff I want to outline here. And uh, just for consistency, for sake, uh, I would focus on uh, on uh, the NLP uh, branch of AI. So in 2013, we had a uh, work to pick, which is simply converting a uh, test on structured data sets to, uh, to vectors, right? And then we put a classifier on top of the vectors. And uh, this was like the standard procedure for a very long time. 
but uh, in 2015, uh, a team from Google uh, worked up this uh, paper on uh, semi-supervised sequence learning, right? Which means that uh, it, with semi-supervised, we are not just providing a uh, vector and then matching them to the uh, to their labels. So in semi-supervised, it was a little bit different. And then in 2017, we are we are the first uh, unsupervised uh, sentiment neuron. And as at this time, not many attention was paid to it, right? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just the same way. We, we are not uh, trying to, we are not providing labels and we're sort of allowing the model to uh, to to find, uh, to 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 uh, select its own labels and make predictions based on, on its own um, selected labels. Yeah. So in 2018, this was when the uh, big stuff started happening. Uh, ULM Fit was introduced by uh, Jeremy Howard and Sebastian Ruda. And what ULM Fit was basically doing was uh, taking semi supervised learning and uh, performing a uh, lot of tricks that made it uh, give us a uh, very useful, uh, very, very impressive uh, outputs and results. Right? And then a little while after, Elmo came out and Elmo was simply taking the LSTMs, uh, LSTMs models and then uh, performing uh, a bi-directional uh, bi -directional LSTM uh, technique. And of course, it achieved better results than the ULM fit model. And then we add uh, GPT-1, which was sort of different because the author was like, okay, instead of using LSTMs, let's try and use transformers, right? And uh, of course, uh, <laughs> transformers uh, gave us very nice results. And BET came along and BET was like, Okay, instead of using just transformers, maybe we can make it bi-directional and uh, impressive results for us here at And since uh, the best period till now, I could say that we've had what I would like to call an explosion of models. Yeah, I mean, we've had uh, bet on stilts, we've had the Gobeka, we've had Orbit, and yeah, lots and lots of models have, you know, uh, have, have been um, produced since then. And that, that's why I sort of label this space as a lot of stuff. Right. Yeah. And uh, the, there are a lot of factors, there are a lot of, uh, you know, pain points attached to this thing that I would love to point out. So let's assume that uh, the first paper, uh, an earlier paper proposed an unsupervised technique called fancy lane, and uh, the paper B proposed another retaining technique known as fancy lane, right? And then, and achieve better results. And most times the differences will just be the kind of data set that was used. Maybe paper A used Wikipedia, and then paper B is using Wikipedia and BBC data, right? So the only difference here is just the data set. So in the second scenario, um, the only difference might just be the parameters. Maybe paper A made use of 100 million parameters for the model composition, uh, and paper B is using uh, 200 million parameters in its architecture. So that means uh, the paper B is achieving better results solely based on uh, the number of parameters used. And um, another scenario is uh, paper A is retained on 100 billion tokens of unlabeled data, and paper B is retained on over 2 billion tokens of uh, unlabeled data. And of course, paper B is achieving better results based on the tokens. And uh, finally, the differences might just be the Adam optimizer uh, uh, between the uh, loss functions. And paper A might use Adam optimizer, and paper B is using STG with monitor. And paper B is, uh, is sort of achieving a better scores solely based on the loss function, the kind of loss function that is being used. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, if you have a look at uh, the list of uh, models on plugin uh, phase, uh, of course, these, these are some of the different variations of, of the same technologies, the same idea, you know, and the only differences are the differences that I just outlined. And what, what will you notice? Do you notice that most of these models are? You know, are built by large corporations um, because they spread by Google, Google by Facebook, and then OpenAI has GPT, DeepMind has Google, and Huawei, Microsoft, and Google has the Swiss Transformer and Glam, right? Yeah, and um, and then there's this uh, there's this uh, quote from Lambda Labs, uh, which states that GPT three uh, has about one seventy five billion parameter, and then uh, and then the model will require the model will require, you know, the model being trained on, uh, being trained on V100, 
uh, we require about 355 50 UES, and that is going to cost about 4.6 million for a single training. And this means that, um, suppose I'm a company, and then uh, I'm spending about $5 million building, a, a, building a, a model, then I might not do the general thing, which is to release the model to the public for researchers to you know examine, improve upon, and yeah, I might just hide the model behind an API to mitigate for some of the cost. In fact, not taking the cost into consideration for anybody to work with all these large models, even if it's open source, is a little bit, it's going to be a bit difficult to do, right? Because of uh, whoever is trying to work, improve upon this model, needs to take into consideration uh, the computing cost that is going to, you know, be needed to effect these changes. Yeah. So most of these are, Models are sort of hidden behind API and you, you know make use of them using APIs as well. Okay, yeah, so that's the pain point. That's the first pain point, and uh, it's about the large cost of uh, building models. Uh, I mean, doing the same thing over and over and over again with just little variations. Okay, so secondly, uh, I want us to as, uh, examine another pain point um, originally outlined by RMT. Uh, by calling Raphael, and um, using this is uh, using uh, T5 as a case study for this. Um, T5 was a model uh, built in uh, 2020, and uh, I think it was the first model to uh, model lots of uh, NLP tags, the test to test, uh, the test to test of problem, right? So, which means that we are using the same technique to, to solve different forms of uh, of uh, NLP problems, yeah. So when T5 was uh, launched, it sort of went viral and a lot of works have been built on T5 model, right? Yeah. So uh, first of all, there is a unified QA, uh, which is uh, which is uh, T5 being trained on additional mixture of uh, QA data set, question and assume data set, right? And then uh, we have uh, another model, which is more core, which is uh, we trained on which is which which is taking unified QA and uh, improving on it, uh, improving on it further and generating data results uh, using additional data set. And then we have a unicorn which is uh, like T5 trained for the uh, common sense data set. Okay, and um, th those are just you know additional trainings. I mean we have the model already and then we sort of uh, training them on additional data sets so that they can generalize better. And, um, yeah, so so over here we have a uh, T5 point uh, T5 one point one edition, and what T5 point uh, one point one edition was doing is take, basically taking T5, and then it's been extended, you know, trained on additional data sets by the uh, the author and by the original authors, you know, thereby producing the more efficient results. And then uh, we have T5 plus LM, which is a uh, T5 1.1. Uh, which is the for point point one trained for that on uh, on next step prediction uh, data set and it was actually better result than T5 1.5 and then we also have T0 which is like a T5 plus LM taking and you know improve further and then we had a T T0 also we have MT5 which is a uh, like a monthly version of uh, T5 because it's trained across uh, the the larger data set of over one. More on data languages, and then we have uh, MT5, and you know it's also performing better than T5 on languages, um, and this inspired by T5, which is uh, simply uh, T5 on the byte five, which is uh, T5 on an extra large data set. We have code T5, which is T5 on code data set, and we have code T5, which is a uh, T5 on the uh for protein for protein synthesis right yeah and then uh and one thing i want to point out is this uh it sets you sort of following the um, evolution of uh, t5 over time then it sort of gets very hard for you to uh keep track of the changes uh, understanding the lineage you know which model is first and which model is after that right i mean if you're looking at t5 and t0 uh <laughs> without having any background knowledge on on T5 on the on the uh, T5 evolution, you'd most likely think think that T0 is the first uh, model before T5, right? Yeah, and um, this sort of uh, makes things a little bit confusing because there is no tool, there is no specific tool that you know 
um, Ava, all these um, all these variations in workplace where you can see where you can very easily track the different changes they made to uh, uh, to models over time, right? Yeah. Uh, now compare contrasting that to uh, our our software that have been developed in open source. You know, I don't know. You might be able to recognize uh, some of the some of the uh, some of the open source tools here, yeah? but <laughs> this this is a Python event, so yeah, you most likely be able to uh, recognize this. Yeah. So let's take Python for example. When uh, Guido Van Rosen uh, created Python and then he made it open source, right? Yeah. And then lots of developers from different parts of the world sort of you know started contributing to Python, suggesting changes and. Uh, the maintainers of Python, you know, are the luxury to accept a particular suggestion or reject a particular suggestion, right? And um, that way, we Python now has lots of tools that it didn't have initially. Speaking of uh, Boolean, speaking of generators, the uh, very recent one, type hinting, right? Yeah, and um, I think uh, that, that's like the strength of uh, open source, which is uh, a a collaborative, uh, uh, a co collaborative uh, community for the development of tools that we all use universally, right? Yeah. And um, of course, here is a uh, lineage of uh, Linux distribution, and you can, of course, this is not very clear, and you can check out the um, the reference over here. But in here, you can see the uh, the different changes to Linux, the different uh, the different uh, patches, the different uh, uh, distributions that that you know are spawned from uh, earlier earlier distributions, and I think this sort of makes sense because if you're not okay with a particular distribution, then you could sort of uh, move on and use another distribution. And if you're not satisfied with the distribution that you you are moving to, you could simply just fork an uh, an original repository of uh, one of the distribution and make the changes that you want to make, right? Uh, nobody's going to pay you for that. <laughs> okay, yeah. So and uh, and uh, over here, I sort of you know put, break down all the steps uh, involved in building open source software, and then uh, how we can relate them to the way we build uh, the way we build models. Okay, so initially, let's say we have uh, a developer, and then uh, the developer is um, using virtual control to you know. Uh, uh, version for two gates and then maybe get up to open source uh, its projects, right? And it can uh, make changes to the local files. And of course, these are communicated in patches. And uh, anybody that is making a, uh, a, a copy of this, uh, of this project on this local machine, is our local machine, can easily, you know, see the patches and, of course, go back in time to work with another patches, another, another, another patch, right? Yeah, and let's say a new developer comes on board and wants to contribute to the projects, and then he or she could easily fork the repository and of course make the changes that he wants to make, he or she wants to make. And, uh, and of course, the maintainer of the project could check out the project and run checks, uh, run tests on the project. And of course, he could uh, he or she could um, agree, uh, you know, judge the judge the uh, efficiency of the changes. And, Agree. Uh, so this is like the sign for okay, right? And agree to match the changes, right? Okay, but let's say that uh, another developer um, comes on board and he or she makes changes, and uh, the maintainer checked out the the changes, and the maintainer does not like the changes. Uh, of course, uh, there's no hard feelings. So the uh, the new developer will simply just you know keep on maintaining his own branch of uh, of the project, right? And uh, and then yeah, and of course, and of course uh, the the uh, the um, anybody that's jumping on this project could easily go back in time to uh, maybe work with an earlier version of this project. And I think that's the beauty of uh, of open source software development, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, but this is not the same for uh, the way we build models. Yeah, I think that's uh, evident right now. But some of you might feel that maybe we already have tools that are doing this version control stuff for models already. I mean, you have models on organ phase, you have you can use weight and biases, you can use ML flow, you can use comments, you can use TVC, but I would argue that they are not really providing uh, the most important uh, the most important uh, um, 
functionalities that uh, uh, version control and open source development gives us. Taking DVC, for example, uh, DVC, DVC is like um, a platform or tool for you to sort of uh, like uh, maintain your features, uh, maintain your 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 uh, trajectory of a, of, a, of a particular model over time, right? So let's say you have a, a data, you have a features, you have models, and you're saving them in memory, right? And then of course, you could update the features, or you could update the data sets, right? And in fact, you could adjust the input parameters, and then you could adjust the input parameters, you could add new features, add new data sets, and uh, of course, over time, all these um, all these changes are saved. You could easily go back in time to work with an earlier version of the same uh, project, right? But uh, it does not what we really want because um, this way you could work with earlier versions, and uh, you could uh, another developer, another data scientist could join your organization and make changes. Um, it could have its own its uh, own version of the of the changes, right? Yeah, and uh, it, it sort of keep a record of it. But when it comes to uh, what makes open source open source, well, I mean, uh, having other developers from other uh, other communities or other other part of the world making minute changes to that same project, right? And there's backward compatibility. You don't have that on DVC. I mean, DVC cannot match updates. Together, can on, let's say uh, um, we have a uh, we have uh, a different models being put on in that same model. Uh, DS DVC cannot match that um, updated model with the existing uh, with the existing uh, version of that model, right? It's going to have to create uh, a new a new what's the name a new patch uh, a new uh, update for that for that changes that has been made. So. That's why DVC is not suitable for uh, the kind of uh, uh, the kind of open source uh, functionalities that we want for uh, to build uh, open source models. And uh, so the big question is this: uh, How can we enable collaborative and continual development of machine learning models? So, what well, one of uh, the two most important uh, uh, the two most important answers is that we need to be able to cheaply communicate uh, patches and Match updates from different contributors. So the patches are like uh, minute changes mixed to you know a, a segment of that uh, of that model, right? And then we want to be able to match the updates. I mean the minute changes being made uh, by different researchers, and you know match all of them into a single update without the, without a decreasing in performance, right? So let's focus on match patches, for example. Um, usually the the, the way uh, the way models, the way we train our models, uh, we have a, uh, we have a, uh, we have uh, a bunch of parameters, and we're, we're computing the graded distance uh, using loss with respect to those parameters, and uh, we are updating these parameters, all the parameters, right? Yeah, uh, and this is how it happens over, you know, the amount of training steps that you know we, we're training for. But uh, maybe if we can find a way to Instead of uh, instead of uh, you know updating all the parameters, maybe we are selecting a top few uh, changes, a top few parameters, and making changes to those top few uh, weights without uh, affecting the performance of the other weights. I mean, leaving them unchanged, right? Yeah. And um, uh, there is this uh, method uh, by uh, uh, one of our polymath students, uh, and then. Uh, it is known as Fisher in this sparse and changing mask. And uh, what it does is that it's uh, it sort of computes the top k parameters that are needed to the change, and then it focus it focuses on trying to change these parameters alone without affecting the performance of the other of the other weights, right? And uh, this actually worked. And then um, it's uh, you can see uh, how well it performed uh, compared to other methods of uh, other methods of uh, you know trying to work with uh, trying to uh, work with uh, uh, parameter sparsity and um, you can see how well it performed there and also here and of course you can check out the paper here. Okay, so the second pain point is how do we match updates from different uh, contributors? And um, and I want us I want to explain a little bit how uh, 
with training and downstreaming works, I mean, how we sort of, uh, you know, improve the model and then work with that uh, improved model, improved version of the model. Usually, we have a deep trained model, which is already been trained on a super large data set. And then we have uh, the downstream task where we uh, take, uh, we fine tune the model on a smaller set of data sets, uh, on a smaller data set, right, to perform a specific task, right? And then there's another approach to this, which is uh, we we take the pre trained model and then we train it on an intermediate task first, and then we take the intermediate task model and perform our final downstream task uh, 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 fine tuning on it. And hopefully, this sort of uh, uh, this sort of achieve better performance than uh, the earlier the earlier approach. Here. But maybe we can do this in another way and. Maybe we can have uh, we can have uh, you know the different models side by side. This was our downstream tax and this was our intermediate tax and maybe we can you know uh, fine tune uh, we can fine tune the model uh, separately. We fine tune it on the intermediate and then the uh, and then the downstream tax and we sort of you know combine both of them to to form the uh, the downstream tax model right. So this should uh, theoretically work better than uh, this or this, right? Yeah. So, and uh, this way we can, you know, sort of uh, take uh, the model, let it work better on uh, on several downstream tags, and then find a way to match all the downstream tags into a single model, right? And that way, that means that we're able to match uh, updates from uh, from uh different parts of the models that are the model that has been worked on and you know combine all the different updates into a single more eff effective model right yeah so um th there's this paper by martina and then he sort of uh, where he use a uh, official weight averaging uh, which is sort of a uh, uh which, which sort of you know um match all the you know all the uh all the uh sort of average the changes across uh, the different models together you know uh, while making sure that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, the global minima is uh, of all the local minima are averaged together is uh, is more optimal than the uh, different model we said, right? Yeah, and um, of of course this also uh, performed extremely well on uh, you know on the on the on the uh, benchmarks that it was tested on. Yeah, so so this. So problems are sort of um, solved, but there are still lots of other problems. I mean, other questions that we might need answers to. And uh, one of them is uh, uh, we need to be able to rapidly evaluate proposed changes to the model to ensure about what compatibility. How, how do we do this? I mean, usually in open source software, we uh, we are able to evaluate, we were able to have uh, tests and then anytime it changed, has been made. I mean, the test is run automatically and it evaluates the proposed changes and make sure that it's not affecting what that particular library can do before, right? And the question is, how do we do this in our in our in our model development? I mean, how do we rapidly evaluate uh, the changes and then and then make sure that none of the functionalities that the model can perform before has not been affected. Uh, uh, regressively, right? Yeah. So one other uh, question that there's no answer to yet is how how do we combine the modular components of the different models to provide our uh, new skills? And uh, let's say I'm trying to build a, a library that one of its functions is taking a JSON file and passing that file and maybe doing something nice with uh, they pass the beta, right? Uh, for something like that, I will most likely, you know, want to import uh, JSON, right? Yeah, I might want to work with JSON or maybe the JSON library to pass that particular data for me. So what I'm basically trying to say is that I'm taking different components, different modules of um, existing libraries and then using them to provide new skills and capabilities. And how can we replicate these for models? I mean, how do we take, um, how do we take, uh, you know, different uh, chunks, chunks, several chunks from different models and uh, 
uh, combine all these terms together to you know, form a new model with new skills and capabilities. Okay, yeah. So um, unfortunately, I have more questions than uh, than answers on this talk. But the main aim of this talk is uh, a call to awareness. I mean, when I uh, when I saw the original when I saw the revolutionary idea from uh, uh, from Colin Raphael back then in his blog post, uh, I was sort of picked on it and you know been thinking about it a lot since then. And uh, this is this is me trying to bring it to a larger populace and maybe give more people are thinking in this uh, direction, in this particular direction. Maybe we can uh, collectively find answers to, uh, to these questions that we don't yeah. have answers to yet. All right? Yeah. Um, all right. So finally, um, giving credit to Colin Raphael for the you know the revolution and vision, the original thoughts and the, and the slides. Um, thank you very much for taking your time to listen to this talk. Hello. Yes. Thank you, Stephen, for your talk.